today I'm going to share with you what I have been working on in the past three years, how we apply broad electron tomography to capture actions of membrane protein in cells. So biology involves the structure and units at different scale, ranging from organisms meters in size down to proteins and molecules in the dimensions of nanometers or astros. So many biological imaging technology are available to us right now. For example, PET and MRI can image organisms at some millimeter resolutions. Light microscopy has been used in cell biology laboratories to track down dynamics of cellular protein complexes at the cellular levels. And then we have the TEM, SEM, actually crystallography, they have generated 3D maps of protein complexes at nanometer atom resolution, atomic resolution. So today I'm gonna to focus on application of TEM, crowd TEM. So imaging use a transmission electron microscope, depending on how you image it, the imaging schema and how you process your data can be divided into two branches. So one of them is called CROW-EM single particle analysis. This is the more popular one, especially after, you know, in 2017, three pioneers won the Nobel Prize because of their contribution to developing this technology to resolve high resolution structures. In CROW-EM single particle analysis, basically, usually we have to purify the protein complex and then we image thousands of them, millions of them. And then we combine information from all those particles into a 3D map. So basically you can imagine the resolution of that map will be very high. But remember, that's a structural average that representing the population. So in CROW-ET, specimen for CROW-ET could be purified protein complex in vitro reconstitute protein complex, just as a single particle. It also could be less homogeneous, like a membrane fraction, an organelle, a bacterial cell, or it could be a subregion of a eukaryotic cell. So we loaded the specimen into the microscope and then we take images of the specimen from different angles. We tilt the stage to take image of the specimen. And then each image represents the structure of the specimen from a different orientation. Then we computationally combine all those images into a 3D map of your specimen. So basically, think of the imaging schema. Basically, 3D map in tomography are reconstructed from image taking of the specimen itself. So the resolution is limited compared to PRO-EM single particle analysis, but it's representing the structure itself, not an average. Because of that, in application site, we can apply tomography to study unique structures. So this is a 3D reconstruction of the famous SARS-CoV-2 very particle on the background of a tomogram slice. So from the 3D reconstruction, you can see the envelope is decorated with spike proteins, but it's not uniformly decorated. That means each individual particle has its unique side of spike proteins. From the background, you can also see that seems like the sizes, morphology, or even genome packing in those particles may not be uniform, might be unique. If you average all those particles into like applying single particle analysis, all those information will be lost. So this is done by tomography of inactivated viral particles extracted from patients. So Tomography can also be applied to study biological processes in cell. This is the work I did as a postdoc at Baylor. So what we did was we image, we applied cryo-electron tomography to cyanobacteria that is infected by cyanophage. We can directly look at cellular changes along the infection pathway. We can computationally extract those particles, very particle from inside a cell, representing different assembling stage and computationally combine them to build a maturation model, how variants maturate inside the cells. So tomography, we also apply it to study polymorphic and dynamic structures. For example, this one is a PC12 cell that transfected with EGFP tagged mutant Huntington protein. So, um, mutation and misfolding of this protein cause the Huntington disease. We can see that inclusion bodies, granules formed by those 
mutated contingent protein, they are dynamic because they're moving everywhere. And also the size, morphology, even the fluorescence intensity are different among different granules. So that suggests the biomaterial property also could be different. This is confirmed by FRET experiment that we also apply cross electron tomography to those dynamic granules and they confirmed the granules is made of amorphic structures. Some of them seems like to form the solid fibrils as we usually imagine they would be. We also identify a type of structures that's also EGF positive, but they're amorphous without the defined structure. So correlating with FRAP, we think the fibrils might be the bright solid one. And then those amorphous structure, the dynamic, might be the dimmer one. So due to the capacity of cryo-electron tomography capability to capture in situ dynamic structures, so tomography has become a very powerful tool, more applied in cell biology to understand integrative structural biology. So today, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take this opportunity to show you how we combine crowd et with complementary cell biology and then data processing to understand structure and distribution of membrane protein complexes. So these protein complexes, they are involved in many aspects of cell biology, but for many of them, they present a very challenging target for actually crystallography or single particle analysis simply because it's very hard to purify them. So story number one is on um, photosystem two. Photosystem two is a um, super protein complex involved in photosynthesis. So this project is in collaboration with Paul Fokovsky's lab at Rutgers and then by very talented hardworking graduate student, Jennifer Ang Huang and postdoc Xuan in my lab and also senior scientist Orly from Paul's lab. So we know photosynthesis, the process generate oxygen to support life on Earth just occurs on the cellular membrane. So the electron flow through the four membrane bound super complexes, it's just like electricity flow in a circuit. So photosystems, PS1 and PS1 and PS2, they are the energy entry point. The two photosystems are interconnected by a membrane bound complex, cytochrome B6. This complex is almost served as a transistor in the circuit. And then the flow of hydrogen iron from stroma into lumen, coupled to electron transport through the three complexes, drives generation of ATP by ATP synthesis. So during evolution, you know, Auto, uh, photosynthetic organisms has evolved a very sophisticated cellular membrane architecture as well as super protein complex organization to be able to adapt to changing environment and also to be more effectively perform photosynthesis and then to reach higher efficiency. So in the long history of evolution, photosynthetic organisms can be branched into two branches. One is called the red lineage, including red algae, diatoms, brown algae, and then also the green lineage, including the green algae and higher plants. In the red lineage, the cellicoid network is a simple. They're made of oppressed cellicoid vesicles. In the higher plant, the cellicoid membrane is more differentiated into the grana, and the lamella connecting the granite stacks. So protein composition in, in green lineage, in cellular membrane are actually uh, strikingly different. So in the granite, we can see a lot of PS2, but PS1 here blue and ATP synthesis, they are mostly found in the lamella and also the top layer of the granite. So some say this is very important because you don't want PS2 and PS1 in very close proximity because that will uh, induce energy spillover, basically chlorophyll excited energy can jump from one system to the other 
which is bad to cause imbalanced electron transfer. But some may not agree to this theory, but one thing people agree is because in the red lineage, the cellular membrane architecture is different, not differentiated into the grana. So the regulation of a photosynthetic efficiency might be different or using alternative mechanisms compared to the green lineage. So nature also involved special super protein complex organization to increase photosynthetic efficiency from higher light harvesting. For example, in the photosystems, the reaction centers are usually coupled with pigment containing light harvesting complexes. Those, they basically serve as a funnel to increase your overall light harvesting efficiency. Here I'm showing you a PS2 structure from higher plants. You can see it's a dimer. So the circle is the reaction center and then it's connected to the multimeric light harvesting complex connected by those monomers, also light harvesting complex monomers. So this arrangement is species specific. Diatoms has different organization compared to higher plants. It also depends on the environment. It provides alternative mechanism to regulate light harvesting. For example, under high light, some of the protein complexes, light harvesting complexes, will disassociate from the core. By doing that, they will reduce the effective um, light absorption area. By doing that, and then don't regulate light harvesting to avoid uh, photo damage to the reaction center during high light conditions. So, you know, to understand photosynthetic uh, organism regulation of photosynthesis, we need to consider both the cellular membrane architecture as well as structure and composition of photosystems. So we decided to perform use tomography to study in situ structure of a photosystem from a model diatom, PT. So this diatom has a panel shape. It only has one plastid in the cell, provide a very simple but decent model system. So in situ study, the number one technical challenge is actually identification of the target from very crowded cellular system in this situation from the cellular membrane. So what we did, we decided to combine immunolabeling on grid with pro-electron tomography to first identify photosystems, for example, PS2, and then move on directly to tomography structure determination. So we prepare cellular membrane from Dytown PT, and then we use the small three millimeter, six millimeter electron grid, EM grid, as a little carrier, a little chip to perform on grid immunolabeling. And then we can directly freeze the EM grid for tomography study. That's how we set up the experiment in the lab. So we're applying a sample to the EM grid for plating. So antibody choices, as I mentioned earlier, PS2, for example, they are biochemically heterogeneous. So some protein complex, some complex will have light harvesting complex, some may not have, but the core, the reaction center is conserved. So we decided to use a primary antibody against a subunit PSBA as a composition of the core. And then this is a transmembrane protein subunit, but it has loops and short alpha helices exposed on both sides of it, including the stroma, the lumen. This is very important because when you plate cellular membrane preparation on EM grid, it could land it both ways. So luckily, even on the lumen side, this subunit interacts with lots of extrinsic subunits but it seems to have a small opening to the outside to allow accessibility of the antibody. After antibody labeling on the EM grid, we apply secondary antibody conjugated with gold, and then we perform tomography. So this is an um, image of antibody labeled cellular membrane versus control. It seems like the labeling is very efficient. And then we did tomography of 
gold labeled membranes, and then we identify two types of structures. One seems to be scattered complexes in clusters. The second type seems like almost like a 2D array structure. So we perform the 2D averaging. We computationally extract those complexes to reach a 2D average. The 2D average showed a very strong C2 symmetry, which expected from PS2 structure. And then the size of the structure match pretty well with published structure from green algae and the red algae. The second type, we also performed 2D averaging and then a really form a very nicely packed 2D crystalline array. We can measure on the 2D average, we can measure the size of each uh, dimer. And then the size also match pretty well with published PS2 structure. We also did 3D visualization. You can see the little dimers. And then I also showed six gold particles that decorating on the surface, labeling those dimers. So to the 2D average, they have some information to show us those are the PS2 structures, but the resolutions are relatively low. And then they're 2D, they can't see much from those maps. So we decided to increase the scale of the project to collect lots of tomograms to allow us to do 3D data processing. So let me see. And then for this time, we decided to use fresh prepped silicon membrane because we kind of know what we should be looking for. So this is one of the tomograms from the top view slice, slice by slice to the bottom. And then you can clearly see some of the little dots. There are photosynthetic protein complexes on the membrane, right? Many of them, okay. And then this is the slice of the same tomogram as I show you in the movie. And then we can clearly pick out the two populations as we identified from our immunolabeling labeling experiments. So type number one is the clusters. And then type number two is the 2D arrays. We first performed 2D averaging and compared those 2D averages from with structures from immunolabeling to confirm their identity. They match pretty well. And then we decided to collect lots of tumograms again. And then we took the most time consuming during data processing is actually annotation because you have to go through tomogram by tomogram to pick up those you interested little dots for next downstream data processing. So we collaborate with scientists from Baylor College of Medicine and decided to do automated annotation by um, convolutional neural network. So in simple word, this is basic a neural network. You provide the input and then adjust the weight and parameter in the hidden layers so that the output match what you provided as the training set. So use the 2D array as one example. We provide the network some positive samples, definitely 2D arrays, and some negative examples, something definitely not 2D arrays. And then we fine tune the network so that the output will label the distinguish between the positive versus the negative to label all the 2D arrays. So after the network is trained, we can apply the network to the hundreds of tomograms we collected. And then all the 2D arrays can be annotated fairly quickly. So we trained one network for the 2D arrays. We also trained another network for the scattered densities in the clusters. So, with a lot of particles, we can finally do 3D averaging. So we can see the subtomogram averaging actually show the structure very similar to published PS2 core from a red alga. Red alga are close relatives of diatoms. They do, they both have a protrusion to the lumen, luminal protrusion, and then they're both dimers. And then here I'm showing you a movie of the super complex. And then the fading pink models are the red algae um, core protein complexes. But see, when we lower the density threshold 
their actual transmembrane density actually show up next to the core. They are the light harvesting complexes. That means those complex inside the clusters are actually associated with light harvesting complex. But the resolution was not that good, suggests the binding may not be homogeneous. For the lower threshold, you can see actually another layer of density on the stroma side of the septimogram average. The distance from that density is constantly nine nanometer away from the PS2 complex. That distance happened to be exactly the layering distance between different cellular membrane vesicles. So we think that additional layer represents the membrane density from the neighboring cellular membrane. And then this is pretty strong density suggests at least the majority of the particle, they are located in the layering part of the cellular membrane vesicles in the item. So we then check some of the tomograms collected on cellular membrane that still partially maintain its native layering. And then that basically confirmed our hypothesis. Most of them are actually mapped to the lower, to the inner layer of cellular vesicles. We don't see much on the top layer or the outside layer, the outer layer. We also performed septimogram average on the arrays, structures from the arrays. We have more of these particles in our sample, so we were able to get a higher resolution of the average. Then again, we fitted the red LG PDB structure, the four core subunit into the average. It fits very well and seems like all density have been accommodated by the four subunit. That suggests the single unit in the array is made of the four co-subunits only, no light harvesting complexes. So we also perform mass spec. Indeed, the four core, PSB, A, B, C, D, it seems to be more abundant compared to other PS2 structure or PS2 uh, subunit. That is consistent with our observation of the 2D array that is made of only those four proteins, right? So from our tomograms, we also see other members of the photosynthetic, photosynthesis process. So ATP synthesis is an easy target because it has the very representative a mushroom morphology, and then we usually find them again as clusters on the high curvature part of the membrane. And then we did perform septimogram averaging just to confirm their identity. We also see the disc-like shape densities on the membrane. We think they are PS, PS1 clusters, but we don't have enough number, enough number to do Septimogram averaging, we probably should have done immunolabeling to confirm their identity. But nevertheless, they seem to form clusters just as PS2 and ATP synthesis. So to summarize this uh, short story, we know in DICOM as a member of the red lineage, it has a very simple, simpler cellular membrane architecture compared to the uh, green lineage as oppressed membrane vesicles. And then we were able to identify two populations of PS2 structure. One connected with light harvesting complex, so photoactive. The other one has no light harvesting complex attachment, so probably not photoactive. It could represent uh, reservoirs of photodamaged receptor uh, reaction re centers. And then those two types, the active clusters versus the 2D arrays are often identified from different pieces of cellular membrane. That recommend that suggests they actually segregate on the celluloid. And also the same segregation occurs to ATP synthesis. From that, we can say, this, despite the absence of stacking in diatom, there are also segregation of photosynthetic chain complexes. 
that suggests an evolutionary convergence between the red lineage and the green lineage. Then I'm going to move on to a second story. Sorry. So how we apply crop electron tomography to resolve fungal glucan synthesis. So again, this is collaborative um, project with David Perling's lab from Hackensack. So it's Jennifer and Chris are really drivers of the project. And they're supported by very hardworking undergraduate Joyce and Nikki, and also former postdoc Paul. So we know fungal, in fact, fungal infection occurs to affect millions in the US, and then we spend probably multiple billions in medical cost. Among all the species, candida species are the major cause of inv invasive fungal infection, especially for patients at high risk. So fungal developmental fungal antifungal drugs are more challenging than the fight against bacteria because they're also eukaryotic. So they share a lot of common features as us, but they do have a couple of unique features that we can use to fight against them. One of them is a lipid composition in the plasma membrane and then the second one, the more important one, will be the, the cell wall. Pollen and azoles are developed against lipid in the plasma membrane, where echinokinin drugs are developed to against the very unique cell wall. Echinokinin drugs, they inhibit the activity of beta glucan synthase. So when we look at structure of fungal cell wall, they are basically matrix of polysaccharide and proteins interconnected through a very complicated network, but they can be somehow divided into two layers. The, in the inner layer, the composition is relatively more homogeneous, made of mostly chitin and glucan. The outer layer is more heterogeneous, more species specific, but also depending on your development stage. So a kind of kinding target uh, glucan synthesis, when we use, for example, Casper function, a member of the kind of kinding drug, treat candida albicans, this is the control. See, very low concentration, you kind of already see deformation of the cell. At higher concentration, 100% minimal inhibitory concentration, there are no cells left. Basically, you only see cellular debris. So glucan synthesis is a big membrane embedded complex made of two subunits. One is that the larger subunit is membrane embedded and coded by the FKS1 gene. It also has a smaller cytosolic regulatory subunit, raw one. So it kind of kinding drugs actually target the large membrane embedded catalytic subunit. Unfortunately, many groups have tried to purify this protein, but not successfully yet. So we actually don't have a high resolution structure to show how the catalytic subunit looked like. So people have done many, for example, um, topology modeling or mutagenesis screening just to get some idea how the catalytic subunit looks. And then this is um, topology modeling to show it probably have about 12 to 15 transmembrane helices. And then the end terminal should be in the cytosolic side, but it's disordered. And then the major cytosolic domain is made of the central domain, where is the catalytic domain should be. The C terminal should be the extracellular site. And then they also, some study also map the amino acid substitutions or mutations that are identified in patients with breakthrough infections, those are all located on three relatively conserved hotspots on the external side of the subunit. Okay. So we decided to skip purification and perform tomography on plasma membrane purified or isolated 
from Candida glabrata. So this is a piece of membrane. This is a raw data called a tilt series collected on those membrane. And you can see the little dots, the membrane proteins. And then we did reconstruction and then try to find putative glucan synthesis on the membrane. We found two structures. For example, the first one, it looked like a little flower of donuts. And then the second one also looked like a little rings, little donuts. So we put them side by side to compare their relative sizes. The larger one, the larger rings is about 170 astron in diameter. The smaller ones is about 125. And then the larger ones also is slightly more abundant than the smaller ones. So which one or either one of them could be the glucan synthesis? So that's what we think. So we know glucan synthesis in the inner cell wall, glucan synthesis is more abundant than chitin. Uh, glucan is more abundant than chitin. And then we know glucan synthesis, the catalytic subunit is larger than chitin synthesis. So we think the larger rings are more likely to be glucan synthesis. So we decided to overexpress FKS1 gene and then to perform analysis to test out if we're right. So we did protein analysis first. It seems like the reconstruction is pretty, the construction is pretty successful. We were able to get about three to four times enriched uh, FKS1 expression on the membrane. And then if we compare tomograms collected from the overexpression strain versus the one well type, we noticed the overexpression also shifted the abundance and distribution of the large rings. So that basically supported our idea. The large ring structures are the glucan synthesis we're looking for. So we did 3D subtomogram averaging from both the well type and the oral expression. The overall morphology are very similar between the two. But because in the oral expression strand, we were able to have more particles to give us a higher subtomogram average. So we were able to eventually get about 14 astrons from the overexpression strain. So at this resolution, you can't look at atomic details, but you will be able to do some domain analysis. So this range showed a very strong apparent six-fold symmetry. So remember from what we saw, from the topology model, uh, FKS1 monomer should have only one major membrane protrusion, protrusion density on the cytosolic side. So because of that, we think those membrane protrusions we identify from the ring-like structures should be on the cytosolic side and then representing those um, cytosolic um, catalytic um, domains. And then we also believe this could be a hexamer because two densities cannot be accounted for for the cytosolic domain of one individual FKS1 subunit, okay? So as we were working on this pro project and then a uh, high resolution 3D structure on um, Salute, sorry, this is to be salute synthesis. Apologies for the typo. It's a salute synthesis in higher plant is published. So the um, cellular synthesis is not in the same family as glucan synthesis, but they are both in the large family of glycosotransferase family. So cellular synthesis forms a homotrimer, and then each subunit as a stock region formed by the end terminal. And just as the glucan synthesis, it also has a large cytosolic density protruding outside. And then each subunit of cellular synthesis will synthesize one polysaccharide from the active site on the cytosolic side and then accommodate it through and extrude it through a channel formed 
between the transmembrane helices. The trimers also form higher order assembly of rosette structure. So this assembly is meaningful because, for example, each polysaccharide from a monomer will form a protofibril facilitate, facilitated by the assembly of the trimer. And then in addition to that, the rosette structure will facilitate formation of the microfibers from individual protofibers from each trimer. So in our case, we think each subunit in the hexamer will be able to generate one glucan fiber from the active side and following similar mechanisms and secrete it from a channel, extrusion channel through the membrane. And then from there, they will be released to the space and then continue with, for example, branching, modification, and cross-linking. Also, we observed clustering of those glucan synthesis on plasma membrane of Candida glabrata. We think that is meaningful. That also suggests that biosynthesis of polysaccharide in the fungal cell wall is not homogeneous. So the biosynthesis might start from localized subregions. The composition of polysaccharide in the fungal cell wall may not be homogeneous as a result. Now it comes to the final question, how the drug attack glucan synthesis? We know there are currently four members in the actinokinding family. All of them share very similar chemical structure. They have a bigger head made of hexopeptide and then a fatal acid chain connected to the head. And then they're among different members, they're only minor side chain modifications. So if we look at the charge on the surface, we have to say the drug, this is a classical function, one of the early member of the drug family. The head seems to have positive charge and then the tail is hydrophobic. So basically this is an antipassic molecule. So at our current resolution, we can't say much. So we reach out to Frank DeMaio's group, set up a collaboration to do structural prediction based on the primary sequence of glucan synthesis. So their structural prediction in terms of the transmembrane helical helices arrangement and the overall domain arrangement match pretty well with the structure released by alpha fold from FKS1 in Saccharomyces, okay? And then here I'm showing you the transmembrane alpha helices from formed by the N-terminal sequence, C-terminal sequence. And then we can actually identify a potential channel between the two domains. And then the cytosolic domain should be there. So next, we mapped the three very predominant amino acid mutations that's identified from patients who develop canokinding uh, resistance. All three of them are actually mapped to the exit part of the potential channel on the external leaflet of the plasma membrane. So we think that is what happened. Each subunit can make a polysaccharide or glucan fiber from active side and going through the potential channel between, formed by the transmembrane helices. And then when the drug attach to the ex external side of the complex, either it blocked the elongation and extrusion of the fibers, or it could induce some pretty major conformational change that can be transduced to the active side that affect um, catalytic activity. Okay. okay. So, you know, the bottom line for my talk today, I just want to deliver to you one message. Crowd ET and Septimogram averaging, they're very useful tools in, in general study cellular, fundamental cellular processes, and they can also be applied 
to study of membrane protein structure and distribution. The resolution compared to single particle analysis, they are limited. It's limited by the nature of sample, also limited by data processing. Tomography is still new compared to single particle analysis. But those low information, low resolution information can still be very helpful because we can use this technology to capture the in situ structure and spatial distribution in the cellular context. So in my second example, I'm showing you how we combine tomography with um, integrative modeling, attempting to study protein ligand interaction. So I'm using this example to demonstrate to you, currently with small atomic structure resolved either by experimental approaches or by structural prediction, if we can combine those high resolution structure with tomography, we will be able to learn more in molecular or cellular mechanisms that you can learn from those atomic structures alone. So with that, I have to thank people in my group and my collaborators to make the story, to help us build a story. So I'm fortunate to have a very hardworking graduate student, Jennifer, Kyle in my group, and then with postdoc, uh, Min is a new postdoc in my lab and he's helping with the glucan synthesis project. And I also have several undergraduate students they've been working with me even through the pandemic on data processing. Tommy, Nikki, who just left from medical school and Joyce still with us. So the PS2 project is in collaboration with Falkowski and Kwang already did most of the biology work. And Max helped us to do biophysical analysis. The glucan synthesis project is collaboration with David. They are the best collaborator you can ever ask for, very supportive and very positive. Data processing in the two projects is supported by uh, Steve and Muyuan from Baylor. They help us to do annotation and troubleshooting in subtomogram averaging. Almost all the data are collected in the proteomics building downstairs in the facility with support with Jason and Emery. So we have a complete workflow from sample preparation all the way to data processing. If you think your project can benefit from tomography, feel free to reach out to Jason or me. And then I have to acknowledge my funding resources and some of the data are actually collected from Purdue University through the high resolution cloud EM consortia supported by NIH. With that, I'm gonna stop my presentation. I'm ready to take any questions you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Wei. That was a great, uh, a great talk. Let me just uh, open the shutter here. Uh, <clears throat> so the, um, as, Wei, as Wei indicated, she's ready for uh, any and all questions. So uh, please, Feel free to unmute yourselves and uh, and ask uh, whatever questions you have of uh, of way. We do have uh, eight minutes until the uh, the close of the event. I'll also scan the chat and see if there are any questions there. So, way let me take the uh, the chairman's prerogative, please, and. Uh, just uh, I'll ask you to uh, to amplify a little bit. You you actually um, you put a question mark uh, against visualizing ligands attached to uh, attached to proteins using cryoelectron tomography, and uh, for very low molecular weight ligands, I can I can see that that's this is going to be a major challenge. But those antifungals are enormous molecules, and I, I wonder if uh, if you have any thoughts about being able to actually see those in situ. Yeah, actually, Stephen, that's exactly what I. That's the reason I put a question mark there. If it's not because of the classical functions, for example, I would say, you know, if I haven't worked on this particular drug, I would probably say no because the current resolution of subtomogram averaging is still 
maybe in a six or seven atom resolution for relative large molecules. So at that resolution, the small drugs, and also because the way it binds to the target, very unlikely uniform, is a very challenging target. But for echinokinin drugs, as you said, they're special. It has a big head, long tail. We also did some like a structure analysis to test how rigid they are. The head is pretty rigid. And then it's in the size of about almost 10 astrons or 15 astrons. So I would say there's a possibility we see them, for example, but I still want to leave that question mark there to say, I don't know for sure how much I will be able to resolve. They could potentially be resolved as a dot, but how much we can see resolving individual side chains, very unlikely. But the good news is we don't have to resolve the side chains in this particular study. We only need to see them on their attachment to the membrane. So I'm pretty positive. I think we're trying it. And they were also trying to see if there are any tricks we can play to make them more visible in tomograms. So I'll keep that question mark here for the time being. Please, please, please do and please persist. Uh, Vasilios, you have a question. Uh, yeah, thank you, Stephen. Uh, way, very, very nice talk. Uh, thank you so much. I have a very general question. Uh, so maybe you can um, uh, answer. So I was wondering, wh where do you think the whole field of cryo-EM, uh, cryo cryo-electron tomography and uh, uh, subtomogram averaging is going, essentially, in the next uh, five to 10 years? What are going to be the hot things, uh, by your estimation, uh, and, uh, you know, how can we drive sort of uh, more um, um, adoption of the field? Like, how can we get more involved? What do you think is going to happen essentially in the field? Okay. So, you know, recently there's a term, you can see a term more in publications. It's called integrated cell biology. So in that aspect, basically people started to really use a tool use tomography as a tool to visualize cell biology. So on the other side, as I mentioned at the end of my talk, I think if you can combine using cell tomography as a bridge to build those high resolution atomic structures, which we have more and more deposit to VDV every day, you will be able to combine the two fields into a big picture to be able to understand the complicated and fundamental biology. That's what I think it is going. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Wei. So there are two questions in the chat. Gloria Rodriguez asks, is there an optimal size for a protein complex to be observed and analyzed by cryo-electron tomography? Okay, so for, I can use the two stories I shared today as a reference. So, PS2 is a huge protein complex in photosynthesis. So for that, it's in the range of about 20 nanometer in diameter. And then if you want to include the light harvesting complexes, they're even bigger. So that is a very, I would say, a very comfortable target for me to study by tomography. So glucan synthase is slightly, is smaller. So one subunit is about 200 kD in molecular weight. If we say it's a hexamer, it's basically about um, 200 multiplied by six. And then that's also a target that's very doable, imageable by tomography. You can easily see them from tomograms. So for membrane proteins, eventually, if you can see it or not, is determined by the contrast. And the contrast is actually determined, generated by the actual membrane density sticking out of the membrane. So we have to discuss this case by case, but generally speaking, targets for tomography are, we want them to be larger compared to single particle analysis. We can't handle maybe a 20K protein complex on membrane. And also, we may not be able to track them down without help 
from fluorescence microscopy. Thank you, Wei. So DJ uh, says, great talk, Wei. Why was it difficult to get atomic resolution of the glucan synthase using cryo-ET alone? Okay, so there are several issues, okay, as I mentioned, related to the sample, related to data processing. So for tomography, this particular sample, I use purified plasma membrane. So compared to single particle analysis of purified protein complexes, there are several differences. First of all, my environment is not as clean. And also because the membrane, generally speaking, are thicker compared to you know, grids formed by purified protein complexes. The contrast is also lower. So there are several factors also in data processing, but I only want to mention one today. For example, the membrane, when they landed on EM grid, they basically laid down. So majority of the protein complexes, you look at, you have the top view or the bottom view, not much of the side view, maybe some when the membrane is wrinkled a little bit. This is called preferred orientation, a preferred orientation. And this is a major challenge for us to move forward. <coughs> Thank but, you, Wei. Uh, let, uh, let me, <laughs> excuse me, let me ask, let me turn the floor over to uh, Greg Critchlow, who, who will ask the last question. Greg? Okay, great, I'm last. Um, <laughs> No, thank you for uh, sharing but not, but your not work. least, Greg. But not least, okay. <laughs> thank you for sharing your work with us. Um, just a very small, quick question uh, about the uh, mutations that you found uh, in the drug uh, for the drug resistance. Are those generally getting mutated to, um, well, what kind of side chains? Are they getting mutated to polar side chains? Um, and they might be something that the hydrophobic tail of the drug would not be comfortable with. And what, what kind of mutations are you seeing? So there are all different kinds of mutations we see. And also we see also deletion. And then, so we think that probably involved in, in how they interact. Those amino acids are probably bending site uh, for the drug. And then the drug, as I mentioned, is amphipathic molecule. And then at this stage, we actually even don't know how the drug binds to those potential channels because we don't know exactly the property of surface of the channel for the drug binding. So they're all different kinds of, I just listed three as representatives and then I need to go back check. But okay. there are a variety of changes involved. Some okay. might be change of the charge, some might be steric. So, so you, you, you mentioned you didn't see the drug yet, but you still don't even really know the channel where the drug is binding yet. We haven't done that. The experiment's oh. going on mm -hmm. right now. That's what we want to do next. It's a good yeah. question. Yeah, it would be terrific to uh, see that. I don't suppose there's a, uh, a gold modified version of that, uh, that compound We're, available. David is making it. Very good. Very We're good. making it, but kind of slow down by the supply chain. Yeah, I can, problems. I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. So that's let's. Exactly um, thank you, Wei. Let's uh, express our appreciation uh, for a great talk. Thank you, and I remind the uh, IQB graduate students that we'll be meeting in thirteen minutes in a separate Zoom room with uh, with Wei to continue the, the discussion. <laughs>